So uh, this talk is about the distributed system at the core of the SUI blockchain. So we call it SUI Lutris, and it will handle all the ordering part of the execution and everything that related to the distributed system aspects of the SUI blockchain. You may have heard about that blockchain, right? So the SUI blockchain is decentralized, proof of stake, permissionless, everything you like. Eventually, it elects committees. And those committees have the classic assumption, Byzantine default tolerance, and we assume, as usual, at most one third are bad. So this is the only uh, introduction that I'm going to make. Um, from now on, since we elected the committee, the consensus and the distributed system will run committee-based. Right? So typical systems work like that. You have transactions that come in. They go through something that looks like a mempool. Some initial checks are done. There is significant redundancy that happens there. Sometimes we propagate more than once the same transactions. And then we go through the ordering layer. The ordering layer at best takes a few seconds. It does consensus, totally orders all transactions. Then it goes through execution. Secu execution is often sequential as well. For instance, if you try to run an EVM on a single core machine, you will get a couple of thousand, hundreds actually transactions per second. And finally, you need to persist all your data structures to make sure that consumers of the blockchain can actually make sense of it, interpret it. So these parts will only be, uh, so the entire part will be about the SUI blockchain, but this talk only focuses about those two. So only the ordering and the execution layer. But since this is a 15 minute talk, I will only focus on the ordering layer first and if there is extra time, I'll be happy to cover the execution part. I can also do it in the questions later. So it requires a new architecture, right? This is the core of SUI Lutris, how, how it actually works and how it innovates. So it's a fusion between a protocol fast, called FastPay, one called Narwhal, and one called Bullshark. So I put this slide here because I think every one of these protocols have been presented in a previous edition of Consensus Day, which is quite cool, actually. So here's the big picture of how the thing works. So the transaction comes in, as usual, and goes to a round of Byzantine consistent broadcasts. We'll go into the details later. Then here is what happened, and here is what new. For most transactions, we immediately execute it and return to the clients a certificate saying, your transaction is executed, final, all done. For other transactions, that are different properties, we'll go into that later, we would require consensus. Traditional Byzantine consensus, we would use Narval and Bullshark in our case, any, anything else can be used. We totally order them, after that we execute them, and then we return the reply to the client telling them that the transaction is fine. After that, the classic checkpoint, Merkle tree, and persistent data structures are updated. So how do we make the distinction between which transaction need consensus and which one we don't? First, we need to observe a few applications there, right? We see that everything that looks like coin balances, transfers, NFT, any game logic where there is a single player that mostly own a character and mutates and makes action over it, do not really require consensus. Fundamentally, they are single writer operations. So as long as the sender is honest, everything should go well. Then, and also most importantly, it won't really affect the performance of other users. Then there are other applications like marketplaces, auctions, and more complicated global controls or collaborative assets that would require consensus. But well, strictly speaking, I know that in theory they may not require consensus, but they cannot, consensus cannot be forego in a trivial way at least. And we don't, we use consensus for all of those. So if you need to remember a single sentence about this entire talk, that is the one. SOI only uses consensus when it absolutely needs to. And it tries to get away with simpler broadcast primitives every time it can in every possible way. So how do we do this? We split the states into two types of objects at a high level, right? So own objects, what we call own objects, are objects that can be mutated by a single owner, by a single entity and those do not go through consensus. And then all the others are shared objects. They can be mutated by multiple owners. So objects look like that at a very simplified view, right? It's more complex in, in, in reality. 
but they have a unique ID. No two objects in the history of the system will share the same ID. They have a version number that gets incremented every time that the object gets mutated. Ownership information, namely who should mutate it, who can mutate it, and then a type. In this simplified view, the type is either owned or shared. The transaction is quite typical, a package defining the function you want to execute, a bunch of input objects that you wish to mutate, arguments and gas information, and then a signature over the entire field. Nothing special here, it's quite classic. So let's take an example of a consensusless transaction. So a transaction that does not go through consensus, and let's see how it executes. So this is an example transaction P1 that takes three input objects, O1 at version 10, O2 at version 27, and O3 at version 1001. The transaction tries to mutate O1, transfer O2 to another owner, delete O3, and create a new object called O4. Here is the general flow, and we're going to go through that flow step by step. First step, this, the sender sends the transactions to all the authorities in the committee. What do these transactions do these authorities do? They look at it. They ensure that in their database, they have every input object as well as the specified version of uh, specified in the transaction. So remember the transaction was specifying input object 01 at version 10, 02 at version 27, and object 03 at version 1001. It does a bunch of validity checks. Those are quite classic. Check the signature is correct, owner information matches, transaction is well formed. But on the distributed system aspect, what they do is that they ensure that no other transaction is currently trying to mutate the same object. Namely, they look at their internal state and they realize that there is a table saying object 01 version 10, none. Nothing is trying to lock it. They update that lock, set it P1. You can see it on the left of the slide in orange. So now all these objects are locked for P1. They reply back to the user by saying, okay, here is a vote about your transaction. It's a signature over your transaction. The user collects a quorum of those votes into a certificate, takes a certificate, broadcasts it back to each authority. Now every authority gets a certificate, verifies the signature, runs a bunch of the same validity checks as before for various reasons. They re-update the locks um, to T1, regardless of whether they had, they, they, they had another lock and maybe they did not need it before. So they may have missed the first phase of the protocol. So they need to do it now. After processing that certificate, it's time for execution. And so what happens when well, they take the transaction, put it into an execution engine and get some results out of it. What do they need to do for that? First, they can increment the version number of every input object that they mutated. So O1 goes to 11, O2 goes to 28. So the real paper actually uses lump or timestamps, but in this case, we just increment by one, it's the same idea. We also reset all the locks, they're back to none. We mutate the, the ownership information when we need to. Remember transaction T1 was modifying the ownership of object O2. We create the new object. That it is, then every authority sends back a sign, a signature over the certificate to the client. And as soon as the client collects two thirds, a quorum of those uh, signature, it can be convinced that its transaction is final and it can go to sleep. So now what happens if the transaction includes at least one shared object, right? Before it was only own objects. Now we have at least one in, in, the, in the transaction. So we need to go through consensus. So it's quite similar in most steps. The transaction T2, our next example, looks like this. It takes object O1 at version 10, exactly as before. A shared object S2 with no specified version. It is unpractical for the user to specify a version number for a shared object since this may mutate very fast when the system is under a lot of pressure. And the output of the transaction will be to mutate object O1, mutate the shared object O2, and create a new object, old object O4. We start as before, disseminate the transaction to all authorities. What do they do? Well, the first thing they do, the authority realizes that there is a shared object in the transaction. And so they only check that the shared object exists. They do not check its version, if it has a version number and what is its version number. Then they do the same checks as before regarding all own objects, namely ensures that 
the own object was not already locked for another transaction, that the object exists and that the correct version that is specified in the transaction. So remember, own object versions are specified in the transactions um, are already in the database. They send back signature to the client. The client aggregates the signature into a certificate. This does not change from before. And then the client sends back the certificate to every authority. But now the authority look at that certificate. And instead of doing the flow they did before, they realize that the transaction contains at least one shared object. So they take it and they input it to the consensus engine, black box consensus engine. After that, they look at the commit sequence, what comes out from the consensus, and they process the transactions. So first thing they do is that they assign a version number to all the shared object of the transaction. In this case, S2, we assign four in this example. We are guaranteed that every authority will assign the same version to every shared object because of consensus. After that, um, same thing as before regarding the own objects. So we check the validity conditions, ensure the certificate is valid, um, set the lock to transaction T2, even if they did not already do it before. And then we can go and execute the transaction because now the shared object and the all objects all have their version numbers. So as before, we update the version numbers of all own object, reset their lock, create object 04. So I'm over time, um, so I'll just go uh, directly to the end. Uh, the last step is the same as before. Every authority sends back the transactions to the, to the user. As soon as it collects a quorum of those signatures, it knows the transaction is fine. So execution engine, not for today, but if you look into the paper, you will find explanations about it. You will find proofs. You will find the checkpoint and reconfiguration um, logic which is actually tricky because we do not have a natural point in time where every authority has the same state. Since there is this consensusless path that can run forever in the background, we need a way to reconfigure the system. And that is it. Thank you very much. If you need to remember one thing, Sui Lutris consensus only when you need to. <laughs>